welcome. Thanks for agreeing to spend part of your morning listening to, uh, to me. Um, I brought uh, a sort of gift uh, from the office. This is the latest issue of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. I think there's enough for everybody. If not, well, you guys can figure out how to share. And there may be some in the library. Um, has some issues that may be germane to what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, what Colonel Davis asked me to do was not only talk about uh, our book, and it's not just my book. I had a team of very talented co-authors, and I like to tell people that it, uh, if it had just been me, it would have taken far more than four years to get it done, and I don't think I'd still be married. But uh, uh, the, the credit really also goes to them uh, and, and to the Brookings Institution, of course, for, for publishing the book. Um, I understand the ground rules for these sorts of uh, uh, of answer that usually things are on a not for attribution basis. Um, because everything pretty much I'm going to tell you is in the book, uh, it would be foolish for me to say, no, you can't quote that. I would be doing myself a real disservice. So uh, nothing, I don't have any problems with anybody attributing anything as long as that's in, in accordance with all of, uh, all of your rules. Um, before I get started sort of on the meat of the matter, um, Colonel Davis asked me to just explain very briefly uh, because I'm, I'm not a physicist, uh, but I do work with them, uh, basically how nuclear weapons work, what their effects are, and then sort of launch into the book. So um, just as I said very briefly, what I wanted to do is, uh, is talk about that. Um, nuclear weapons are basically liberating, uh, are, are used to liberate the uh, enormous energies that are in, uh, contained within the, uh, within the atom. And uh, it was discovered that you could actually do this in the 1920s and 1930s when scientists found that uh, various, several materials, including most notably uranium, uh, were unstable or radioactive and emitted uh, uh, energy that uh, if you could harness it would, could in fact be used for a weapon. When it was discovered that if you bombarded uranium-235 uh, with a neutron and it emitted a little more than two neutrons, people figured out very quickly that if you got enough of this material together, you could set off a chain reaction. And depending on the amount of material you had, that would determine how large your weapon was. And that really set off the race for the atomic bomb uh, right around 1939, 1940. Of course, our Manhattan Project started in earnest in 1942. Germany was working on a program. Japan even had an early uh, nuclear weapons research program that didn't get very far. Uh, the principle behind nuclear weapons, uh, let's take the little boy bomb that we dropped on, uh, on Hiroshima. This was a bomb that was considered so reliable that we never actually tested it before it was used. That weapon used uranium-235, which is not a natural form of uranium. Natural uranium that you would find in the ground is mostly uranium-233. And for every, I don't know what the ratio is, but let's say for every a uh, pound of uranium-233, you might have um, a few, uh, uh, you know, less than an ounce, let's say, of uranium-235. So you've got to enrich it. And that was done through enormous industrial processes in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, using electromagnetic separation, taking into account the, the chemical differences between uh, uranium-233 and uranium-235. We tried a number of other ways to do this, too. Um, and I'll get into what that cost um, uh, in a little while. Uh, but basically, in the Little Boy bomb, it was essentially a large tube. On one end, you had high explosives uh, pushing a plate, which on the other side had a, uh, a chunk of uranium-235. And at the other end of the tube, let's say about the length of this desk or so, was another chunk of uranium-235. Both chunks were subcritical. In other words, by themselves, they could not achieve a chain reaction. But once the high explosive went off and propelled one chunk into the other, they met. They achieved criticality, and you had an uncontrolled chain reaction. Uh, scientists realized fairly early into the Manhattan Project that plutonium-239 would actually be a better material for building nuclear weapons because you didn't need as much of it. And it was also not quite as expensive to produce. But the key to getting plutonium is that you actually have to burn uranium in a reactor first. And so we ended up doing both routes. The other problem with plutonium is that unlike uranium, it's very hard to get enough of it in place before it starts to go critical. Um, that's because uh, every uh, uh, large amount of plutonium-239 has some amount of plutonium-240, another isotope of plutonium. And that plutonium tends to fission spontaneously, which can set off your chain reaction before you want it to, which is not a good thing uh, 
if you happen to be carrying one of these weapons around. Um, also, plutonium-240 has another consequence, which is it tends to poison or slow down the chain reaction. And so in order to have a nuclear weapon made out of plutonium, rather than bringing two pieces together with plutonium-239, uh, if you tried to do that as you did with the uranium bomb, by the time the pieces got about this close, before they actually got close enough, they would start to fission and blow the weapon apart and you would have a very low yield weapon. What the scientists uh, realized they could do was to have a sort of sphere of plutonium-239 in a subcritical state. So let's say you needed five pounds of plutonium-239 to have a critical mass. Uh, they would maybe have three pounds of plutonium-239. And what they did was they compressed this with high explosives uniformly uh, arrayed around the sphere. And by compressing it in just such a way, they were able to make it go supercritical, and then it exploded. So those are the basics of, 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 of nuclear weapons, and uh, that much uh, fundamentally has not changed. Today, of course, we have very sophisticated nuclear weapons. The early nuclear weapons were essentially uh, handmade devices. Today, they are uh, quite sophisticated, at least in this country. And uh, uh, in addition, of course, those are atomic bombs, thermonuclear weapons, hydrogen bombs, are, were the next step in development. Those actually require an atomic bomb as a trigger uh, because hydrogen bomb is triggered by the enormous radiation and uh, pressure and heat generated by an atomic explosion. So first, of course, we had to get the atomic bomb before we could get the hydrogen bomb. Those, work, those bombs work by having an atomic bomb go off within a casing and the radiation shoots around. This is all happening within micro nanoseconds. Uh, shoots around in the casing and hits a, uh, 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 an, an, a mass of uh, lithium deuteride, um, which then uh, fuses. The hydro hydrogen bombs are also called fusion weapons, uh, whereas atomic bombs are fission weapons, splitting atoms apart as opposed to fusing them together. And uh, the lithium deuteride fuses and releases enormous energy, and then for added oomph, you have a jacket of depleted uranium or uranium-238 around the entire casing just to hold the whole thing long enough, together long enough to achieve uh, a very large reaction. Um, and then, of course, that material ends up fissioning as well, and you get an even larger yield. So it's a fission, fusion, fission reaction. Uh, for neutron bombs, by the way, they just remove that outer jacket of uranium-238, and all the initial radiation goes right out of the casing. And the neutron bomb, as you probably know, is the bomb that uh, was derided in the 1970s and 80s as uh, killing people but not hurting buildings or military equipment, anything like that. Um, we built some of those weapons, but we never actually uh, uh, deployed them because of political outcry. In Europe, um, the effects of nuclear weapons, again, you've, you've probably gone over this, or you, you certainly will. Uh, uh, of course, the, there's the initial blast effect. There's enormous heat, uh, prompt radiation. Of course, there's electromagnetic pulse, uh, which is something that we didn't discover until right before we stopped testing nuclear weapons in the atmosphere in the 1960s. You've got the blast wave. You've got ground shock. Uh, you've got, depending on the size of the weapon and where it blows up, you may have a firestorm. Then, of course, there's fallout from the weapon, uh, which can cause uh, acute radiation sickness. And, uh, of course, if you know, people were speculating in the 1980s that if you had a global thermonuclear war, you could even create something called nuclear winter, where the amount of fallout and the amount of dust and soot raised by the fires and the firestorms would essentially block out a significant amount of sunlight uh, in the northern hemisphere and then drifting down into the southern hemisphere, enough to alter the climate, change how we grow crops, change the weather, um, that sort of thing. So those are just sort of the basics of how the weapons work. Uh, again, I'm, I'm not a physicist, so I'm not going to get into all of the details. Um, but all that is un, unclassified. Um, but what I really wanted to talk about was sort of the gist of the book. Now, I know you've been looking at the book, and I know Colonel Davis passed along the paper uh, that I sent. So I'm not going to get into every single detail there, because I think it'll probably be uh, a bit too redundant. But I do want to go over some of the basic findings and some of the things that I didn't cover in, uh, in those papers and that I don't think were part of the assigned readings and then we can get into uh, a good discussion of everything. So I guess the first issue is how much did we actually spend on nuclear weapons? And that's in the book, of course, but uh, that, that's in focus. Um, 
But we spent, uh, the United States spent in the range of about $5.8 trillion on nuclear weapons from 1940 through 1996. I should say that we stopped our counting in 1996 because we had to publish the book at some point. Uh, and so that's when we stopped counting. The costs, of course, uh, continue. We we're spending about $35 billion a year on nuclear weapons and related programs uh, every year right now. Uh, so you might add another uh, $100 billion or so to that figure uh, to get the overall amount. A um, few interesting things about this. Of course, you can see most of the money that we spent was in the area of deploying the bomb, about almost 56% of all the money we spent, and that's $3.2 trillion. Uh, I would just add, as I did in the, in the, in the paper, that all the figures that I'm going to give you, uh, unless I say otherwise, are in adjusted 1996 dollars. So we've removed the effects of inflation. So a dollar in 1950 is worth the same as a dollar 1980, as far as our study is, uh, is concerned. Also, the 5.8 trillion includes projected future year costs for uh, arms reduction, for cleaning up and managing nuclear waste. It doesn't include any future year costs for supporting the arsenal. That was too iffy for us to calculate. And that's all detailed down here um, in the footnote. Um, if, you just stri if you strip out all those future year costs, we're talking about $5.5 trillion over a uh, you know, 50 plus year period. So most of the money we ended up spending ended up going in the area of deploying weapons, which would be all the delivery systems, the thing that makes your weapons useful. And that's important for a couple of reasons. One is that it's just such a phenomenally large, large figure. The other is that although no one is going to attempt to copy the United States in terms of what we did with our nuclear weapons program, A, because they don't have the money to do it, and uh, B, because it'll be less expensive for somebody following us to do what we tried to do really from scratch, uh, we do think that rough ratios are generally uh, going to hold true. So for example, India and Pakistan, which have not by and large weaponized their nuclear capability yet, ought to be worried about what it will cost to go from simply testing nuclear weapons to actually putting them on aircraft, building missiles, building a command and control infrastructure, and all of that. Uh, it's relatively inexpensive. I guess the one lesson from our book is it's relatively inexpensive to acquire a nuclear weapons capability. I mean, we only spent $409 billion on building the bomb, and that includes producing all the uh, fissionable material, the uranium and the plutonium and the tritium for our weapons, as well as building 70,000 warheads between 1945 and 1990. Um, and of course, we have to do all that from scratch. No one had done that before. If you try to acquire nuclear weapons capability by, let's say, stealing a nuclear weapon, it's obviously going to be much less expensive. Um, other major categories of expenditure, uh, you see that uh, the orange slice here, uh, what we call targeting and controlling the bomb, that's largely contained in chapter three of the book. Uh, that would be sort of the brain and the spinal cord of our nuclear forces, if you will. It's not simply enough to have a nuclear weapon. You have to make sure that you can use them properly. You can have a coordinated response. And at least for the posture that the United States developed, uh, we had all sorts of uh, uh, procedures and plans in place that required us to do things at a very specific time frame in a very specific way. Other countries I don't think have quite except for Russia, have quite such a sophisticated notion of how to use nuclear weapons, but it ended up costing us a great deal. And within that slice is the amount of money that we estimate was spent on gathering intelligence related to nuclear weapons capabilities. That's also detailed in Chapter 3. Obviously, all that information is classified. What we've done is do our, our best guess on that. Uh, defending against the bomb, which is the blue slice here, $937 billion. Sometimes that surprises people. That's for air defense, missile defense, anti-submarine warfare, and civil defense, with civil defense being the smallest of the four. Uh, we did spend a great deal of money on that, particularly in the area of air defense, and I'll get into that uh, a little later. And then I guess finally, you've got the green slice here, $365 billion. That is what we have spent, but mostly what we project will be spent on cleaning up our nuclear weapons production facilities and to a much lesser extent some of the military bases where these weapons were deployed during the Cold War. Um, now, things you don't see on here, for example, are the cost of nuclear secrecy, because the chart just wouldn't show it. That we projected it being at a minimum $3.1 billion. But that's really just for processing clearances for people for a very specific time period. 
It doesn't include a whole range of things. Uh, part of the problem with trying to account for nuclear secrecy is that the government has never kept track of what it costs to keep things secret, either for conventional weapons or for nuclear weapons. Uh, but the Department of Energy has a rule of thumb. That rule of thumb is that it, a classified program, on average, will add about 20% to your costs uh, over and beyond an unclassified program. And we did a little calculation and figured that if that rule of thumb were to apply across the board to the activities that we're talking about here, then conceivably something in the neighborhood of $1 trillion of the 5.8 that we're talking about can be accounted for by various secrecy measures. And I'll get into what those secrecy measures are. Now, we didn't include that in here because to do so would be to double count. But I think it's important for people to understand that Secrecy, at least as we practice it in this country, and security as we practice it, is a very, very expensive um, undertaking. Now, that's obviously a lot of money just sort of in the abstract, but how does it relate to, uh, to other things? Well, this just so it's, sort of gives you an idea of how the U.S. government has allocated its money over the years. And what we've done here is array nuclear weapons spending against all the other major expenditure categories that are put together by the Office of Management and Budget. The uh, most expensive category, perhaps not surprisingly, is national defense at $13.2 trillion. Uh, now that excludes our red bar here of nuclear weapons. We've deducted that because we don't want to double count. Um, OMB doesn't separate those two because, again, no one has ever attempted to do what we have done, which is to pull out the nuclear weapons costs uh, and, and aggregate them over time. Uh, the second most expensive program is Social Security, about 7.8, 7.9 trillion. And then nuclear weapons comes in um, at number three. And then you've got all the other things that the government has spent money on, natural resources, the environment, veterans benefits, health. And this is just what the federal government spends money on. It's not the states or localities or anything like that. Um, and then way down at the bottom here, you've got energy, energy production and research at about $315 billion over that entire period, 1940 through 1996. And just to put that in perspective, uh, I mean, we put that in the book, that's 11% of all government spending over this period was spent on nuclear weapons, 29% of all military spending over the same period. When we talked to people when we started this project, we had people telling us they thought maybe 10, 15, maybe 20 percent of the military budget over this period was allocated to nuclear weapons. And a number of people, I think, were surprised that the figure was relatively high. Um, obviously, if you spread out $5.5 trillion over this time period, it's not a tremendous amount of money. But grouped together, uh, it certainly is larger than most people understood, uh, understood it to be. So what did we get for all this money? Uh, well, we built 70,000 warheads, as I mentioned, and we built 65 different configurations of warheads. We had nuclear landmines, nuclear artillery shells, nuclear torpedoes, of course, the warheads on top of our long-range missiles. We had warheads on submarines. We had air defense weapons. Uh, you name it. If we could put a nuclear weapon on it, we usually tried, and more often than not, we succeeded in doing so. Uh, we uh, produced 725 metric tons of highly enriched uranium, uh, a little less than 104 metric tons of plutonium, and a somewhat lesser amount of tritium for these weapons. Uh, to put all this in perspective, when the megatonnage of the U.S. stockpile peaked, when the explosive yield of our stockpile peaked in 1960, uh, we had the equivalent of about 1.4 million Hiroshima-sized bombs in our arsenal. Uh, today, the arsenal is obviously significantly smaller. The total stockpile is in the range of about 10,500 warheads, about 7,500 of which are strategic, a uh, few tactical, and then a bunch in storage. And that is still very powerful. It's about 125 to 135,000 Hiroshima equivalent weapons. Again, if you could parcel all of that firepower out into those size weapons. Uh, we conducted 1,030 nuclear weapons tests more than all of the other countries in the world combined. And you can see we started off fairly slowly, and we started ramping up pretty quickly here in the late 50s. This pause here in 59 and 60 was the bilateral moratorium between the United States and the Soviet Union, which ended when Nikita Khrushchev decided to resume testing. Uh, 
and then we really resumed testing in earnest, and then right prior to the comprehensive, or sorry, the partial test ban treaty in 1963, we both set off more weapons in one year than we had ever done previously. The United States, I think, set off something like 92 weapons that year, about 39 of which were in the atmosphere, most of which were out in the Pacific. And then we signed the test ban treaty, and testing dropped down to lower levels on an annual basis, but still much higher than we had done prior to the test ban. And then down here at the end, 97, 98, sorry, you can see India and Pakistan um, sneaking in there. So we conducted all those nuclear weapons tests. Uh, what else did we build? We built 6,125 strategic ballistic missiles. Uh, we have 11 types, 4,700 strategic bombers, also in 11 types, 59 strategic ballistic missile submarines in three different versions, and tens of thousands of additional shorter range systems, many of which were dual capable. And in my paper I described, and in chapter two we described how we accounted for those dual capable costs. If you want me to go over that again, um, I would be happy to. It's a point, you know, worth debating over where the where the figure ought to be. The fact is that, again, the government didn't segregate nuclear and non-nuclear costs. So what we end up doing is taking a very conservative approach and saying 15% of those costs over that time period may have been allocated to nuclear weapons, when in fact I think uh, certainly for about the, er the first 20 or so years it was probably significantly uh, higher than that. Uh, if you're interested, the Manhattan Project that I mentioned earlier cost about $22 billion. And 63% of that money was spent enriching the uranium at the Oak Ridge facility in Tennessee. The next largest amount was spent at Hanford producing the plutonium, and then relatively little was spent at Los Alamos, where the scientists were putting all the weapons together. Um, this just sort of gives you a sense of how our nuclear stockpile stacks up against others. I'm sorry I haven't had a chance to update this, but the figures aren't significantly different. Uh, today than they were uh, in, in 1998 when we put this together. But here you see the uh, buildup of U.S. strategic and non-strategic weapons over the years, as well as Russian non-strategic and strategic forces. And then down at the bottom, you've got the United Kingdom, France, and China. And if they would have shown up, I would have put uh, Israel, India, and Pakistan, except we don't know how many weapons India and Pakistan have uh, for sure. And Israel is rumored to have about 150 to 200 weapons. Um, what you can see, a couple of interesting things. One is that most of our nuclear weapons were non-strategic or tactical weapons. 36% of our arsenal was not for use directly against the Soviet Union. It was for use on the battlefield or for, let's say, air defense missions over the United States or our allies. Uh, the Russian and Soviet non-strategic line item is still, there's still a great deal of uncertainty about what that figure ought to be, which is why that line looks rather peculiar. Uh, we do know that they basically kept building weapons even though they no longer had a need to build weapons. Uh, the bureaucracy simply uh, uh, continued to function there even though people realized that more weapons didn't need to be built. And I do not believe as yet there has been an accurate accounting of uh, exactly how many weapons they have built, which is a continuing concern for proliferation reasons in terms of trying to figure out exactly how many weapons there were at the end of the Cold War and where they all are now. Uh, unfortunately, we missed some, uh, some golden opportunities about 10 years ago, 8, 10 years ago, to work with the Russians, work with the Soviet Union, to try to account for all these weapons, get an actual account of them right then, and then as we started to wind things down and retire them, we could actually keep track of where things were. Today, uh, we just basically have to take each other's word for it, and for all intents and purposes, that's really not good enough. Uh, when, when was the opportunity? Well, there were people right around the time that the Soviet Union was starting to collapse in between, let's say, 90 and 91, who were trying to work with U.S. government officials to get them to engage with Soviet and Russian officials to uh, try to enter some agreements to uh, basically exchange data with each other about how many weapons there were, where they were located, so we could avoid any confusion about weapons in the future when we started to get into uh, uh, reductions along the lines of start or if we had any agreements on, on tactical weapons and for reasons having to do with concerns about security on both sides uh, as well as I think just some uh, stubbornness on the part of the Russian side, we never were able to uh, exchange those data sets. 
and uh, the result being that um, it's going to be very difficult in the future to go to very, very low novel numbers of weapons because we will never be sure that we've actually counted everything. Um, that's unfortunate, but it's just the way things are uh, today. Um, another way to look at what we got is to look at strategic offensive nuclear forces. And this chart also tells an interesting story, which is uh, uh, one of the bomber gap. I probably don't need to familiarize all of you with the bomber gap or how it was uh, perpetuated uh, on the part of, uh, uh, by Russia bamboozling us and then by our intelligence services willing to believe the absolute worst. Uh, but here you see the buildup of U.S. bombers. This is the 4,700 or so bombers that we built. And right around this time period, 55, 56, uh, U.S. intelligence was estimating that the Russians would be building something in the neighborhood of 500 bombers uh, by the early 60s. And that led the Air Force to, uh, which felt that if we were building that many weapons, surely the Russians would, would want to as well, um, uh, led us to increase our bomber production. Well, of course, once we had uh, the U-2 flyovers, once we started having satellite photo reconnaissance, we realized very quickly that the Russians had nowhere near as many bomber aircraft as we had anticipated. In fact, you can see that down here in the blue line. They never had anything approaching the 500 bombers during the entire Cold War. And uh, I think most people would, would agree that their bomber force was a, a pale shadow of, of, of the Air Force's. Uh, but here you see the result of what, what we did there. We started building up these enormous numbers of aircraft and then slowly tailed off. And then you can see also the ICBM uh, uh, buildup and the submarine launch ballistic missile buildup. And really, except for the buildup of, of ICBMs where the Russians uh, surpassed us in the mid-60s, and then with uh, submarine launch ballistic missiles uh, where they again surpassed us about five or six years later, uh, just in terms of numbers of actual delivery vehicles, we always had more warheads, uh, strategic warheads, than, uh, uh, than they did. Uh, you can see sort of how the dynamics uh, uh, developed here. And again, I'm sorry I didn't update this, but it's not radically different, partly because Congress will not let the United States uh, reduce nuclear forces, uh, or let the President and the, and the military reduce nuclear forces below START-1 levels until the START-2 treaty is uh, ratified. Uh, of course, the Russians uh, have now ratified the treaty. Uh, the United States Senate has yet to look at the conditions that the Russians attach to it. And so we're in this interesting situation where uh, we've got people at STRATCOM who are saying, you know, we would really like to reduce to lower weapons. We think we can go down to 2,000, 2,500 warheads. We very much like to implement START II levels because we're spending on money on weapons that we plan on eliminating. We don't want to spend money refurbishing MX missiles that we are going to junk pretty soon. Uh, and yet they're unable to do that because of this legislation. That legislation was actually recently rescinded in part because uh, uh, Governor Bush has expressed an interest in doing what his father did when he was in office, which is doing some unilateral reductions once he is, once he is uh, elected, if he is elected. And in order not to complicate his life, the Senate uh, rescinded in part uh, that restriction, although it doesn't take effect until after the, uh, after the election. Yeah, let's see. Uh, you might be interested to see what delivery systems cost. So this is just for strategic systems. It was too hard to get data for tactical. And basically what you can see from this is that uh, uh, bomber aircraft uh, have gotten progressively more and more expensive as time goes on. Uh, and missiles have uh, started getting less expensive. And then when the MX got more, that's partly a function of the fact that we only ended up deploying 50 rather than the 200 that were originally envisioned. And then you see submarine launch ballistic missiles being uh, relatively inexpensive. If you're wondering where the B-2 is on this chart, uh, I had to eliminate it because once you put the B-2 on, everything else shrinks and doesn't really give you a, a real sense of, uh, of the scale here. And I'm not casting aspersions about the value of any of these weapons. I just think it's useful to know what they actually cost to, uh, to produce. Sorry. Sorry. Yes? You mentioned the missile type itself, but you don't mention the missile platform for the SLBMs. Right. That was just for the actual missile. For the platforms, it's, yeah, like, for example, the ICBMs doesn't include the, launch, the cost of the launch complex. The bombers did, doesn't. Did that for the bombers, though. No, the bombers didn't include the cost of the bomber base. 
uh, the air base, uh, and the submarine missile didn't include the law, the cost of the submarine. So it's, it's not the best comparison you could make, but at least it's, it's relatively honest, I think. Uh, uh, well, I'd see that, if you're not going to count the bomber base, that's fine. You right. don't count the submarine docking station. Right. But you still have to count the platform itself. Uh, right. see, you can have a missile, but not the weapons. You missed a little bit of apples and oranges. Right, and right. Comparison. No, clearly, if you add in, if you add in the cost of the submarine, to uh, if you add in the cost of the submarine here, I mean, obviously, I don't think anybody would disagree that the uh, the, the submarine force is probably the most expensive leg of the triad to operate, uh, and the missiles are the least expensive. Uh, Land-based missiles are the least expensive to operate. This is partly because. It's uh, communications and, and the reactors and their fuel and so forth. Uh, uh, but uh, I mean, that's that's a value judgment over where you get your, your your biggest bang for the buck. But clearly, yeah. I mean, it's if you would add in the submarine costs here. I mean, part of the problem was we couldn't get, believe it or not, accurate data on the cost of the uh, uh, Polaris, Poseidon, and Trident subs. Uh, that I mean, the Navy had one. Sorry, I served on a Trident submarine. Uh, our Rule of thumb is that the, the boat itself cost about $1.5 billion, mm -hmm. has a lifespan of about 40 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can do, yeah, I mean, there's all sorts of different comparisons you could do. How much does it cost per year or, you know, over time? Um, again, I'm not trying, we were not trying to sort of pass judgment on, you know, saying, oh, well, we shouldn't have bomber aircraft because they're too expensive, or we should have more submarines because they're less expensive. It's just to show what the data that we obtained from the Defense Department show, which is roughly what it costs to actually acquire the, the, the delivery system, what you, you know, how much it costs to actually field it is a whole separate thing that we do get into uh, in the book, but not in this, not in this specific chart. Let's see here. Uh, one interesting thing that we found when we started looking at expenditures for uh, research and development on the part of uh, the Department of Energy is, uh, well, the following. Here you see in red the average annual cost for what we now call stockpile stewardship, but what used to be called research, development, testing, and production. And you can see that it ramps up pretty steeply in the, in the early 60s here, and then sort of peaks, drops off again uh, in the 70s, drops out, and then peaks up again uh, in the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, and then as it goes out here and we end in 1998, you can see that we're actually spending more on average today than we did during the Cold War when we were actually building and testing nuclear weapons at a fairly great rate. Uh, part of the reason for that is that the Stockpile Stewardship Program is a very expensive program. It was originally projected to cost $4.5 billion over 10 years. Uh, next year's budget, I think, takes it up to $5 billion a year. And with some of the cost overruns they're having on their major programs, I would not be surprised if it gets uh, significantly higher than that. Uh, the Department of Energy disputes these figures, which come from them, saying that, in fact, stockpile stewardship is less expensive than what we were spending during the Cold War. But, uh, you know, data or data, uh, if they want to come up with some other figures, which they haven't done yet, I'd be happy to review them. Um, but the fact is that we are spending more today doing relatively less. I mean, we're not, we haven't built any new, new nuclear weapons since 1990. We stopped testing them underground in Nevada in 1992, and we, uh, you know, the program is significantly smaller in terms of infrastructure and personnel than it was, let's say, even then in 1985, and yet we're still spending more than we did on average uh, uh, during the Cold War. So, um, I have a question. yes. That's a good question. I will get back to that uh, later in the talk. In, in chapter 10, I believe, of the book is all about economics, and there's actually a chart in there that goes over some of the spinoffs, and we were actually talking about that at, at, uh, at breakfast this morning. I, the short, actually, I'll do it now. The short answer is that, yes, there are spinoffs from the program. Uh, we use retired ICBM, uh, ICBMs as uh, satellite boosters today, for example. Uh, there are various things that we learned in the development and production of nuclear weapons that have translated to varying degrees into the private sector. Um, but as I think any economist would tell you, if you 
want to set off to develop some, some new imaging scanner or uh, some new launch system, it's much better to do it outside of the military in an unclassified form and in a very direct fashion rather than relying on some program to ultimately come up with something which may or may not meet your exact needs. So it's, I'm not at all saying, and we do not say in the book that, I mean, even if you think uh, uh, that we needed every single nuclear weapon that we built, uh, that this money was somehow wasted. Uh, no, what we're saying is that uh, uh, I don't think you can justify the cost of the program on the basis of the spin-offs, partly because there weren't enough of them, uh, and partly because it's very hard to quantify exactly what they were. I mean, certainly there were spin-offs from the space program, too. But I'll get back to that. Um, so what did we, uh, what did we need? I mean, we built 70,000 warheads, we built all these missiles, we built all these submarines. Was that what was required? I mean, it's very popular today, or at least it has been, and certainly we've gotten various critics of the book, people reviewing it have said, well, you know, we won the Cold War, obviously all of this stuff worked. Okay, maybe we didn't need to have every single thing, but by and large it worked. The point that we're making in the book is not that nuclear weapons were unnecessary uh, or anything like that, but that there was never really a fundamental, uh, completely rational process developed for how we would acquire them and in what numbers. Uh, the result being that we ended up building far more than most observers at the time thought necessary. Now, my colleagues and I don't have any special expertise or psychic powers or anything to divine exactly what the numbers ought to be. I mean, the, one of the problems is that deterrence is inherently subjective. Uh, and, you know, what might deter you might not deter me. At least that was the sort of thinking that went on in, in military circles during the Cold War. And uh, as a result, it was never really possible to say this much and no more. Uh, although some people did try at various times, and we do point out, I do point out in my paper, we point out in the book, uh, Admiral Arleigh Burke, for example, when he was Chief of Naval Operations in 1957. This was in part at a time when he was trying to compete against the Air Force, but he felt that just 232 warheads would be enough to uh, achieve deterrence and obliterate the Soviet Union. Uh, however, he posited that we would probably need to deploy about 720 warheads to make sure that those 232 would actually survive and reach their targets because some might be destroyed in a first strike, some might not work, and so forth. And I find it interesting that at the time he said that we had six times as many weapons in the arsenal as what he was recommending. Or a few years later in 1960, General Maxwell Taylor, who was going to come on, go on to become the uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, opined in a book that he wrote after he initially retired that several hundred uh, missiles, presumably armed with several hundred warheads, because we didn't have MIRVs at that time, would be sufficient to do enough damage to the Soviet Union to deter war. And at the time he said that, we already had 7,000 warheads uh, in the arsenal. Or in what may have been the most exacting effort to calculate this, in 1964, uh, Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara and his staff calculated that 400 equivalent megatons, which are megatons weighted to take into account the varying blast effects from warheads of different yields, would be enough to destroy the Soviet Union as a functioning society. And at the time he said that, we had 17,000 equivalent megatons, or 17 billion tons of TNT, contained within the U.S. nuclear arsenal. So why was there always this huge discrepancy? I mean, even today, there's a huge discrepancy between what the military says is required, what politicians seem to think is necessary, what the public feels comfortable with. Uh, why was there always this, uh, uh, this gap? And, and how did we arrive at these figures? That's really the, the focus of the book. Um, and I'll just run down some of the reasons. Uh, first and foremost, I think, is that there was a very strong interest immediately after World War II, and then certainly after the start of the Korean War, to acquire nuclear weapons in large numbers. Uh, and one of the things I found most interesting was a speech that was given in the Senate by Senator Brian McMahon, who uh, before he died was the chairman of the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy, which was set up under the Atomic Energy Act as the congressional overseer, if you will, for the nuclear weapons program. It was uh, 18 members, nine from the House, nine from the Senate. And they were the go-to committee before armed services and anything else. They had total authority 
over this program uh, for, for many, many years. And in 1951, uh, McMahon gave a speech where he basically argued that we could get a bigger bang for the buck with nuclear weapons, and he explained to his colleagues why. And I just wanted to read a short selection of that because I think it really illuminates not only his thinking, but I think the thinking within the military at the time. And he was getting advice from people in the Army, the Air Force, and the Navy about nuclear weapons. And McMahon said, I propose an atomic army and an atomic navy and an atomic air force in place of the conventional defenses we now maintain to the tune of 50 or 60 billion dollars a year. And he had argued earlier in his talk that if in, in a rather, uh, 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 and I think this was in the introduction, in a very interesting rhetorical flourish that we would bankrupt ourselves on the shores of time if we attempted to best the Soviet Union by trying to outspend them. We would never be able to do it and we might as well just give up now. But nuclear weapons offered a solution, he said. He says, here's what I mean by an atomic army. Fewer foot soldiers armed with rifles and more specialists equipped to fire an atomic shell wherever the enemy masses his troops. Fewer mortars and more short-range guided missiles with atomic warheads. Fewer flamethrowers and more radiological warfare. I have in mind air-ground teamwork with light planes capable of hurling atomic weapons at en enemy troops, supply dumps, and transportation choke points. And here is my conception of an atomic navy, nuclear-powered submarines, almost unlimited in range, nuclear-powered aircraft carriers capable of launching planes which carry the atomic bomb on both strategic and tactical missions. And keep in mind, this is long before we had started work on the hydrogen bomb, or at least long before we had the hydrogen bomb. <clears throat> ship-based atomic artillery, ship-based guided missiles with atomic warheads, atomic mines and target-seeking torpedoes which deliver atomic explosives. An atomic air force, for its part, will seek out and destroy with atomic weapons the enemy's industrial sinews of war. It will fire missiles with atomic payloads. It will deliver the hydrogen bomb when that most terrible of weapons is achieved. Even more, it will visit atomic fury upon the very airfields and bases from which an aggressor would strike against our cities. And then he goes on to explain how all of this would be much less expensive than nuclear weapons and how eventually, within a very short period of time, five, ten years at the most, nuclear weapons would cost less than a single tank. Um, this is what was driving things. And, and part of the reason, by the way, that people thought that is that there was no accounting for what all of this was costing, as we talked about in the introduction. Uh, but what accounting there was, was just counting what the Atomic Energy Commission was spending on research and development and production of weapons, which was relatively small, and not counting at all what the Air Force, for example, the Air Force being really at that point the only nuclear capable uh, uh, arm of the military was spending on its aircraft and refueling and all of that, uh, which tended to skew the picture. Um, today, it sometimes tends to go in, um, in the other direction. Uh, you look at some of the reports from the Secretary of Defense, and it only counts the cost of, the, uh, of uh, Major Force Program 1, which is strategic nuclear forces and doesn't count any other things that go into making that force usable and certainly doesn't count the cost of the atomic energy, sorry, the Department of Energy, even though that's all part of the same account, the 050 account that all military spending comes from. So that was sort of what was driving this mindset that this would actually be less expensive, although no one ever bothered to check and see if this was, this was actually true. Um, we had arbitrary decision making, uh, coupled with poor to non-existent fiscal accountability, and, uh, well, I already mentioned the, the issue of the cost, so, and I'll get into what that arbitrary decision making was. Um, when McMahon made his speech, uh, right around this time, people were getting very concerned that we didn't have enough nuclear weapons. Uh, and, and, and I think there was one thing you really need to understand about how this program developed was that it came around at a time where a lot of other things were happening in the world, and if things had turned out very differently, the program might have looked different, but that's not the way that it happened. So right around the time that we were starting to f try to figure out what we should do with nuclear weapons, you had China going communist in 1949. You had the first Soviet atomic test in 1949, which caught a lot of policymakers off guard, although our scientists have been warning for years, really since the end of World War II, that the Russians were only a few years away from achieving this capability. The problem when it came to the politician was that it was a rolling four-year period. So in 1945, they said, well, it might be about four years, five years before they get nuclear weapons. And then the next year, they said, oh, it's going to be another four or five years. So it did really catch them by surprise. Um, you had uh, uh, the beginning of the McCarthy period. You had the unmasking of Klaus Fuchs. You had the Rosenbergs. 
Uh, and then you had the start of the Korean War, which a lot of people at the time thought might, the beginning, might be the beginning of World War III. And people were really, really anxious and nervous and felt that nuclear weapons, having helped win World War II for us, would probably be our best and maybe our last uh, defense against uh, communism. And there was a real push to try to build more weapons. The problem from Congress's standpoint, from the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy standpoint, was that the uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff were basing their requirements on what the Atomic Energy Commission could deliver. They didn't actually have huge nuclear weapons requirements. They were perfectly content with what they were proposing. But Congress wanted to see us building rather than tens or hundreds of weapons a year. They wanted to see us building thousands of weapons a year. And so they increased the spending for uh, nuclear weapons production very, very dramatically. And in fact, we've got a chart here uh, that's also in the book that shows this in a very, um, very compelling way. You see here in uh, 1950, sorry, 53, fiscal 53, so the decision was made in 52, that all of a sudden they're proposing to spend, this wasn't all spent in one year, it was spent over some of the preceding years, but we're proposing to spend uh, more money than we actually spent on the Manhattan Project uh, in, you know, and allocate that amount of money in one single year. And what that resulted in, in part, was an enormous overproduction of highly enriched uranium in plutonium. You can see here all the money that we spent and then we tailed off. And the reason we started tailing off here in the mid-60s is that by 1964, President Johnson realized that we had more highly enriched uranium than we would ever need. And so he unilaterally halted highly enriched uranium production for nuclear weapons. We continued doing some, some enrichment for the Naval Nuclear Propulsion Program. Yes? So, genuinely a question. Um, having grown up in the 50s, um, I remember um, practicing civil defense. Um, I remember as a child in school having to hide under my desk. I remember growing up in Miami that people were desperately trying to build bomb shelters in a, in a state that has a very, <laughs> the water level <laughs> is real high, so there's a great deal of frustration. But people were genuinely frightened, really scared. And Congress generally responds to um, their constituents. And so um, even more than pork barrel or anything else at that time, I, I would propose that this was actually a response to the fear on the, par on the part of the American public. And quite frankly, the fear was so great, I'm not sure that any amount of dollars would have been too high right. to spend during, and is that right. maybe what you're? I research? think that's no. I think that's very. I think that's very fair and a good observation. I think certainly the politicians were responding to that, and yeah, it's very difficult to kind of go back now and try to envision, for those of us who weren't alive then, what that period was like. Uh, but it was certainly a major driving force. I think the the specifics about exactly how we should respond was something that was very much driven by congressional interest and the interests of the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy in building significantly more nuclear weapons. I'm not sure, I haven't done a huge survey of the literature, I'm not sure that there were many people in the public calling for increased production of nuclear weapons on this scale. And I think certainly one of the issues that, that we get to in the chapter on secrecy is that had people known exactly how expensive this was and how risky this was for some of the communities living around these facilities as well as the people who were downwind of the test site, they might have had uh, some different thoughts. Of course, there was never any real public debate about that uh, because the government never let loose all of the facts about this, I think in part because they were worried about just that sort of reaction, but that's something we can probably debate till the, uh, till the cows come home. But I think that's, you're absolutely right. I think that was definitely part of what was driving all of this. Um, but anyway, after we produced all this material, we ended up halting production of uh, highly enriched uranium, and we still have that enormous surplus of material today. And we also overproduced plutonium, although we didn't stop producing that until the, uh, 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 the 19, late 1980s. And I think one consequence of this, one reason that I think it's of concern that this program was not more tightly bounded, is that we now have to deal with all of that material. It doesn't effectively go away. It just it sits there, and you've got to find a way to deal with it. We couldn't burn it up in all the nuclear power plants in the world if we wanted to, and that, of course, would create other proliferation concerns in, in, in terms of producing more uh, plutonium, which is a, a serious uh, uh, problem. And of course, then there's the waste issue. Producing plutonium, in particular, is a very, very, very uh, 
uh, not only expensive process, but it produces enormous amounts of waste. I forget what the exact figure is, but for every, uh, let's say, ounce or pound of plutonium, you're producing many, many pounds of liquid waste because plutonium is produced by burning uranium in a reactor and then re reprocessing that uranium fuel using liquid acid and other things. And it just creates enormous amounts of waste at places like the Hanford Reservation in Washington State, the Savannah River plant in South <laughs> Carolina. And we're still dealing with all that waste today. And that's one reason, one major reason why we face a cleanup bill on the order of 300 plus uh, uh, billion dollars. Um, yes? Are you going to go into this issue any deeper than, than this? What do we do with all this? How much is it? What are the implications for the future? The waste or? Yes. Uh, Excess waste. Yes, yes. That's, that's, that's near, the end of, uh, near the end of the talk. Um, OK, uh, we went through that, uh, talked about, well, let me just give you something on, on secrecy was also something here. Uh, we've got a whole chapter on secrecy. I can't get into a whole lot of detail, but in the Q&A we, uh, we can talk about it. Uh, I already mentioned roughly how much the secrecy might have cost um, in total. But secrecy also impeded debate within Congress and within the military. I mean, I don't think many people realize this, but General LeMay for many years did not submit his targeting plans to the Joint Chiefs of Staff because he didn't feel they could be trusted with it. And for their part, the Joint Chiefs did not have the capability of assessing the early plans because they didn't have the computing capability in Washington. That was all out in Omaha. And so there was this real disjuncture where plans were created that were not being overseen by the people who had the authority to oversee them. And of course, Congress barely got uh, engaged uh, in that debate at all. I mean, we've got quotes in the book and other stuff that's not in the book about people calling for production of more weapons at this level and more weapons at that level without any discussion of how those weapons would be used, simply that we should have uh, more of them. But, uh, and, and secrecy also in acted in another interesting way, which is that like for the first five or six years of its, of its existence, the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy, which as I said was charged with overseeing this entire program for the US Congress, did not want to know how many nuclear weapons we actually had in the arsenal. So at the time McMahon gave that speech that I read, I think right after that he got the numbers, but at the time he gave that speech, he did not know how many weapons we had in the arsenal. In fact, many people within the military didn't know how many weapons we had in the arsenal. It's sort of atomic lore now, but when President Truman authorized the Crossroads test, Operation Crossroads at Bikini in 1946, he was appalled to learn shortly before the tests were conducted that he had authorized the expenditure of one third of the entire US nuclear stockpile, um, as were several atomic energy commissioners who thought that we had many more weapons and were producing far more material than we actually were. Um, secrecy also came up in another interesting way. Um, in 1974, James Schlesinger, Secretary of Defense, was concerned that deterrence might not be as strong as it should be. And he issued a new, um, targeting guidance, which stipulated that we ought to be able to destroy 70% of the Soviet Union's economic infrastructure. You know, why 70 and not 85 or 62 or 45? Uh, largely an arbitrary, arbitrary construct. But that was the figure that they stuck with. And that was transmitted down the chain of command of the people that were doing the targeting at SAC. Problem was, when it got to the person whose job was to implement that guidance, it was misinterpreted to mean not 70% of the entire Soviet economic infrastructure, but 70% of every individual target. And so suddenly, and unbeknownst to anybody, because this was all done in secret, there was this phantom requirement created for thousands of new warheads that had not uh, uh, existed before. And this um, glitch, if you will, was only discovered in the late 1980s when...
switch, if you will, was only discovered in the late 1980s when General Lee Butler, as uh, the head of SAC, head of STRATCOM, did the first ever review of the SOP, actually sat down with all the targeting folders and went through every single target, uh, which is amazing and had never been done before, and saw enormous redundancies and talked to staff and ordered a vast elimination of a lot of targets, which is one reason that uh, uh, a couple of years later that uh, President Bush was able to reduce our nuclear forces unilaterally and change some of our targeting policy because we no longer had that phantom requirement hanging over our heads. So that's kind of one of the problems you have when, when secrecy tends to uh, uh, govern how a program uh, 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 is run. Um, another important factor is that nuclear weapons were considered free goods by the military. The Army and the Air Force and the Navy never had to pay for the warheads that they requested. So there was never an incentive not to ask for a nuclear weapon when a conventional one might do and not to ask for lots of nuclear weapons. Uh, so for example, you have uh, 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 General uh, James Gavin, who's the head of Army Research and Development, going up to Capitol Hill and testifying in 1956 and 57 that the Army alone required 151,000 warheads for use uh, on the atomic battlefield, mostly in Europe. And this was predicated in part on needing to use 423. That was the figure that came up with 423 warheads in a single day of intense combat. Um, they must have had some interesting war games to come up with that number. Uh, but keep in mind that you know, we only ever produced 70,000 warheads throughout 45 plus years. And at the peak of production, we were only producing about 7,100 warheads a year. So it's a truly phenomenal number. And then shortly after that, as I pointed out in my paper, uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff were recommending a warhead level from 68 to 73,000 warheads. There must have been some discussion. It's not in the report that we found about how that figure was arrived at. But uh, there are a number of people who have uh, said, a number of people who were involved in the program that said if the military forces had had to pay for those warheads, the arsenal would have looked very, very different and almost certainly been a lot smaller than it was. Um, there was also a lot of inter-service rivalry, probably not a surprise to anybody here. Uh, of course, the Air Force came out of World War II being predominant, and of course, the nuclear weapons being as large as they were, being the only force that could actually deliver nuclear weapons. And very quickly, the Army and the Navy realized that if they were going to survive in the post-war period, they needed to develop nuclear missions too. And so without really giving a tremendous amount of thought, I won't say they didn't give any thought, they did, but not giving a lot of thought to uh, how these weapons would be used, uh, the services started developing requirements for weapons. And one of my, one of my favorite stories, and we've got a, uh, a picture of this in the book, is the uh, story of the Davy Crockett. This is... Uh, Basically, a, uh, and there's some wonderful video footage of this, this is, that has been declassified recently. Um, sort of a nuclear howitzer, if you will, had a range of about one and a quarter miles and was designed to be used en masse against Soviet troop concentrations in Europe. This is the actual warhead in here in the fin case. And the warhead weighed about 54, 55 pounds, and this whole assembly weighed about 78 pounds. It could be carried by a single person although typically it was mounted on one of these tripods or it could be fired from a jeep. And uh, the Army just thought this was a wonderful thing, uh, that it, would, it was truly a bigger bang for the buck, and built these weapons and deployed them in, in the thousands in Europe, several thousand in Europe, and then started doing war games to see how they could use them, and discovered to their surprise and probably their chagrin that the weapons weren't really accurate enough for the mission that they were intended and they also created some rather severe command and control problems because, of course, if you're going to have these used in the very first uh, phase of the war, you're going to have to authorize their use at a fairly low level of command. And that created some uneasiness uh, 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 on the part of the higher-ups. And in fact, there's a rumor, I've never been able to substantiate it, that when President Kennedy came into office, he was so alarmed by this weapon that he ordered it to be immediately withdrawn. But it stayed uh, around for another 10 years. Um, but, uh, oh, and by the way, that, that weapon had a yield of uh, uh, less than a kiloton up to about one kiloton, which is still significantly larger, let's say, than the bomb that destroyed the Murrah, build, the Murrah building in, uh, in Oklahoma City. Mr. Short? Oh, do you want to break? Okay. Okay. Um, well, you can take a question, and then I can wrap up, and yeah, we can do that, sure. Yeah. I, just, I, did, I didn't see in the readings what the... Uh, I saw the range, but I didn't. What's the destructive radius of that thing? It seemed like this guy would be danger close as soon as yeah. he pulled the trigger. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
You know, I don't know what the destructive radius is. I mean, it's, uh, I don't have my little bomb calculator here, but, uh, well, there would have been a lot, and this wasn't the only nuclear weapon that the Army had deployed. I mean, there were other things that were a lot more powerful. Um, it, it would have been very messy there. I mean, and that's one reason, quite frankly, that the Army, or, uh, not only the Army, but all the services started doing things like this, which is to take troops out to the Nevada test site have them witness a test and then march to ground zero. Um, the interesting thing about these exercises in which something like 200,000 military per personnel participated in the 50s and 60s here at Nevada as well as out in the Pacific is that they were designed in part to measure troop psychological reaction to the nuclear battlefield to see if we could actually fight a nuclear war. And the Russians did the same thing and so did the Chinese. Uh, problem was that everybody was extensively briefed ahead of time over what would happen, what type of weapon would be used, where it was going to go off, how big it would be, what the effects were, how you shouldn't be worried. And so lots of the, the people evaluating the soldiers after the test said these tests have almost no value whatsoever in determining how troops would react because everybody knows what's going to happen. You know, th what you really ought to do is just take them out there and not tell them anything and set these things off. That's not what they said, but that was the implication. And then see how they would react. So, uh, and unfortunately, a lot of these exercises ended up contaminating a lot of the troops that were involved, and a number of them uh, became ill. Uh, many have died. Uh, some have sued the government. There have been various measures enacted by Congress to uh, compensate the, uh, the atomic vets for the exposure that they had, and uh, it's, it's become a, a controversial chapter in, in, in how to prepare for nuclear war in this country. So, Boyd, you um, so I've got a few things I just wanted to run through and then and just open it up uh, because uh, Colonel Davis asked me to get to a few things that I haven't gotten to yet. So this might not be in exactly the order I would like it, but I just do want to get to them. We were talking about secrecy, and I just we've had a lot of debate in this country over the last year or so about secrecy, what with the Wen Ho Lee case and Chinese espionage and John Deutsch and missing hard drives at Los Alamos and all of that. Uh, and I think missing in all this debate or one of, the, one of the misassumptions, I guess, in this debate is that everything that is secret ought to be secret. And you probably know better than I do that there's lots of things that are classified that really ought not to be classified as secret. And I think one of the problems that the scientists at Los Alamos have, other people within the uh, uh, military, not so much the intelligence community, have with some of this secrecy is that they realize how arbitrary some of these decisions are about what's being kept secret. Certainly we found when we did our book that we found a lot of things that uh, we could not get access to that should not be secret. I mean, we have to really fight, for example, the Defense Department to get access to the uh, future year's defense program historical database. Not that we wanted to know how many weapons were in each category, but just the numbers that were uh, showing what had been spent historically. And uh, it took a great deal of cajoling over a year and a half to actually get access to those figures. And there may, in fact, be some justification for some of those to be classified. And there were several categories that we didn't get, and that's fine. We understand that. But there's a lot of other things that are classified that shouldn't be. And I just wanted to give you a, a really good example. Um, this is a, uh, a letter that was sent to President Kennedy in 1961 by the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy. Uh, it, came following a visit that the JCAE made to Europe to, as they say here, to look at their uh, our, uh, U.S. nuclear weapons deployments over there. And in this letter, uh, uh, which uh, was declassified by the Department of Energy in 1996, you see that they visited uh, more than 15 nuclear weapons installations in eight countries from the U.K. to blank. And uh, then on the second page, They said that, uh, in particular, the problems with Jupiter missile bases in blank and the problems of unauthorized use, blah, blah, blah. Um, well, if you know, at least according to the Department of Energy, where Jupiter missiles were based, you possess classified information. Uh, I mean, people know where Jupiter missiles have been based since the 1960s. This is really not a secret, and yet for some reason a declassification officer, or a classification officer rather, at DOE felt the need to blank out the name of that country. Even more interesting is the fact that the exact same document is available at the National Archives where it was declassified in 1988. And there you can see that they went from the UK to Turkey, which is where, in part, Jupiter missiles were based. So, uh, and this is just one example, and there's many others that
that, uh, that I've collected, that my colleagues have collected. Uh, it's not at all to say that there are not a lot of things that should be kept secret. There absolutely are. But I think people would respect the system a lot more if the things that we were kept being kept secret were actually things that needed to be kept secret and not frivolous, uh, unnecessary stuff uh, like this. Um, let's see. Somebody asked about the, uh, the environmental costs, so I just wanted to get into that uh, briefly. We can do more in Q&A. Um, as I said, one of the reasons that we have this huge cleanup bill is because we overproduce these materials. The other is that the whole issue of what to do with the waste from bomb production was essentially ignored for 45 years. It wasn't really until 1989, 1990 when a new division in the Department of Energy was created to deal with this that significant amounts of money started to be spent on it. In fact, if you look at the chart, and there's a chart in Chapter 6 of the book that deals with this, you'll see that uh, in the late 70s to early to mid 80s, we're only spending in the range of a few million to a few tens of millions to at the very end of that period, I think it's like $100 million, which is not loose change. But given the magnitude of the problem, it's practically nothing. And then with the creation of the energy, uh, uh, with, with Energy's new uh, Office on Environmental Restoration and Waste Management, suddenly you start seeing $1 billion, $2 billion, $4 billion, $6 billion a year being allocated toward this mission, whereas previously we were spending very little. And what was being spent was being spent on dealing with waste from ongoing production activities and rehabilitating facilities that were 30 or 40 years old that if they were not rehabilitated would not continue to operate. Um, but there was very much a mindset at the Department of Energy of, and in its contractors, and the department is unique in that it has contractors running these facilities. The edict was production first, everything else secondary. And that largely, it was self-induced, but it also came from, uh, I think, a, a sense that Congress really wanted this to be this way, that build the nuclear weapons, and then if you have any money or time left over, deal with things like dealing with the waste, dealing with, with uh, worker safety, dealing with public safety, that sort of thing. And that's one reason why there was a lot of classification about these activities, because they didn't want people to realize that these wastes were accumulating, that they were being dumped in unsafe conditions, uh, that toxic and radioactive waste were being burned in open pits, for example, at the Idaho National Engineering Lab, or at the Rocky Flats plant in Colorado. Uh, instructive, and I think we put this in our paper, uh, the, the high-level waste tanks that were built at Hanford during the war uh, were understood to be simply uh, an expedient temporary measure that would be revisited once the war was over. But no one ever went back and looked at that. And the tanks started leaking almost immediately. And the result is that you've got an enormous radioactive plume of waste that is moving toward the Columbia River. Although years ago, the scientists at the lab were saying, oh, you know, it'll take hundreds, thousands of years for that waste to migrate to the river, let alone off site. And in, in fact, it only took a matter of, uh, uh, of years, less than, less than a decade. And that's at a number of facilities around the country. Had there been more of an emphasis on dealing with the waste as we were producing it, had there been more openness about the program, had people understood what we were getting into, uh, I think we would have had a somewhat different approach. The reality is now, as the National Academy of Sciences just reported last month, is that many of these sites are so contaminated that for all practical purposes, they will never be cleaned up. And we are in the process of creating what are effectively national sacrifice zones, where we will clean them up the best we can, put up a fence, and tell people to stay away forever. And that's unfortunate. But as bad as it is in our country, it's significantly worse in Russia, where there were not even the most rudimentary environmental laws or uh, uh, ways of getting the, uh, the uh, politicians involved, where liquid wastes were injected into the ground and have migrated into rivers, where nuclear reactors were dumped into the sea because they didn't want to deal with disposing them on land. Uh, where not even basic precautions that we took, which were certainly not enough, to protect people from the effects of atmospheric nuclear testing in Nevada were not followed. And the people in Kazakhstan in particular have suffered uh, very, very ill effects as a result of that. Um, the irony of all this is, of course, that our nuclear weapons were designed to obliterate the Soviet Union and vice versa. And really the people that were hurt the most by our weapons were our own people. And the people hurt most by the Russian weapons were the Russian people. Just a fact of life in the Cold, uh, in the cold War. Um, what, is, uh, what does all this mean for the future? That's something that, uh, uh, that I was asked to talk about, too. Uh, 
Well, as I mentioned earlier, we're spending something in the range of about $35 billion a year for our nuclear weapons programs. Uh, this figure is more or less the same today. In fact, it's probably a little higher, and you can see how that breaks down. Most of it co goes towards supporting the, the stockpile, and uh, the next biggest chunk goes toward dealing with cleaning up nuclear waste, compensating people who were harmed by nuclear weapons production and testing activities, and then you've got arms control, ballistic missile defense, congressional oversight, and so forth. And if you want a better breakdown of that, this is on our website, by the way. Uh, you can see that uh, the largest chunk, uh, chunks are controlled by the Department of Energy and Department uh, of, of Defense. And DOD costs, they are starting to come down, but again, they're being hampered by this inability to come down to start two levels. And you know, what I've been reading, what I've been hearing from people is that there's a lot of frustration that you know, the Air Force, for example, has not budgeted next year to either support or destroy the MX missiles that would be retired under START II, and uh, therefore they're in a real bind because they don't have the money to do either, and yet they've got to do something. Uh, you know, they don't want to spend money refurbishing Minuteman missile silos, for example, that are due to be destroyed uh, in the Navy for a while until it decided to retrofit the Trident II missile on, on the, uh, the remaining Trident I submarines was uh, at one point interested in trying to reduce uh, their costs in that area as well. So uh, again, these costs are likely to stay more or less stable if we decide to deploy some sort of missile defense system, which uh, given the latest out of the Pentagon seems to be not something happening in the very near term, then those costs will certainly uh, begin to rise. Um, but what are the implications basically for this study for uh, the rest of the world. Well, one is I mentioned that you know if somebody wants to try to acquire nuclear weapons, it's going to be a pretty expensive undertaking if they want to do it, uh, quote unquote, right. Uh, it, it's distressing to me to hear officials in India and Pakistan learning exactly the wrong lessons from the United States and, and, and the Soviet Union, saying, "Well, you guys managed to do this and survived in the Cold War. Well, we can too." When of course they share a common border, whereas we did not. They are fighting wars. Uh, right now, which we were not, uh, they have effectively no warning time. And even if they had the early warning radars and satellites that we have, by the time they detected something, it would be too late. Uh, so it's, 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 it's problematic, I think, for them to think about creating some sort of deterrent posture that would be stable in any sort of way once they begin to weaponize. Uh, and yet they're, they're taking a lesson from the U.S. Soviet experience that we managed to survive without blowing ourselves up and therefore they can too. Uh, I think the reality about nuclear weapons vis-a-vis -vis the US and the Soviet Union is that they were an important contributor to how we interacted with each other and the rest of the world, but they're not the sole reason why there was no nuclear war. There was a very large and robust conventional force, for example, which we used uh, very effectively a number of times during the Cold War. And the effect of that in terms of deterring other countries cannot be discounted. There was a very poor understanding of what the Soviet Union's motivations were. I think now we, we tend to recognize that they were not the 10 foot tall uh, scientific behemoths that we made them out to be in the 1950s and 1960s. They were certainly very formidable, uh, but we ended up, uh, because we had poor intelligence about them, because we had not developed those capabilities yet, assuming the worst, which is probably the right thing to do under the circumstances. But we built up forces on those assumptions and then didn't go back and change that once we realized the reality of the situation. Um, I think it's fair to say that other countries seeking to acquire nuclear weapons are going to do so or not do so based on their own determination of what their national security requirements dictate. But the United States as the leader in this area and as the only country to actually have used nuclear weapons does uh, tend to uh, have an, uh, an important responsibility or at least is looked upon as setting the example in this area. And what we do in some senses does matter. So it's very difficult for us, for example, to tell India and Pakistan do not test nuclear weapons again when we, are, when we have a 4.5 or a $5 billion a year program that allows us to test nuclear weapons and computers without blowing them up underground. That's allowed under the treaty, but it presents problems for us uh, uh, diplomatically. Um, it's problematic when Russia comes to us practically begging, please, let's reduce to 1,500 strategic warheads together uh, uh, bilaterally, and we tell them, no, we have a strategic plan, a, a targeting plan that requires us to have this many weapons, and we're not comfortable going to lower weapons. 
Uh, I think we have uh, in the world today probably more to fear from the, the weakened Russia that we face today than we did from the apparently formidable strong Soviet Union during the Cold War because Russia is so weak. Uh, they are not in complete control of their nuclear forces to the extent that, for example, guards at facilities are foraging for food when they ought to be at their guard post because they're not being given enough food. They're not being paid enough. Uh, you have, uh, of course, I don't think I need to say anything about the Kursk disaster, but it may at least have in part been the result of poor training and the fact that, or lack of adequate training, and the fact that sailors are not getting enough time to go out and practice. Uh, you have uh, pilots in the, in the Russian Air Force that have, I think, what is it, like 25 hours a year of flight time, which is incredible. I mean, I wouldn't <laughs> trust anybody on 25 hours a year, and yet they still have responsibilities for, uh, for, for nuclear weapons missions, as well as other missions. Um, this presents a problem, and it's, it's distressing to me and to some of my colleagues that we're not doing more to try to work with Russia to help them build down that threat so it's less of a threat to us and less of a threat to them uh, when instead, as we uh, apparently, uh, not apparently, as we did tell them in January of this year when they expressed concerns to us in negotiations about the effects of our national missile defense or our proposed national missile defense system, don't worry. Our system is designed to take out 20 warheads. You have thousands of warheads. You should continue to maintain those warheads and maintain them on quick launch alert as you do now because therefore uh, our system will not be able to defeat it and you will know that you will always be able to fire out from under us should we decide to attack you. Um, that's, to put it mildly, in incredible that we would make such an argument to them. Uh, I think we have a lot more to fear today from nuclear weapons being used against us or our allies uh, than, than, uh, than, than we might imagine, certainly than I think the public understands. And we should think very carefully about anything that we do and say programmatically or diplomatically that lends, I think, more credence to nuclear weapons. I think nuclear deterrence may have worked, but we really don't know because there was no World War III. When I flew here yesterday, my plane did not crash. I can attribute that to a number of things, the good piloting skills of the pilots on the two different aircraft I had, good weather, reasonably good weather, uh, good flight uh, air traffic control, uh, lock. I mean, it could have been any of those things, or it could have been none of those things, because I don't know, because it didn't happen. So I would be very careful about saying that nuclear weapons would be reason that we managed to come out of this in the way that we did. And of course, as we point out, I think both in chapter three and in the conclusion of the book, uh, if safety had been our fundamental priority, which some people say it was, we would have had a very different nuclear posture than we did. We had a nuclear posture that was geared, and still is geared, to quick launch on warning because we could never rely, despite the hundreds of billions of dollars that we spent on command and control, we could never rely on those systems surviving long enough to provide for the kind of measured uh, programmed response that we had uh, always planned to do. And that's another lesson for other countries is that they're never going to be able to solve those problems either. So. That sounds great. Audio visual folks too. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. Um, but, uh, but that posture drove us to do a number of things that in retrospect were, were, were rather dangerous and, uh, and, that, and led the Russians to do, to do things to respond. And one of the, I guess one of the final points I would make is that we uh, failed consistently on a number of occasions, uh, policy makers, intelligence analysts, and other, others to uh, understand, to appreciate how what we were doing would impact upon the Soviet Union and how they would respond, and then how that, how that would drive us to respond. I think we've gotten a little better at doing that today. And part of it was just due to the fact that we had very poor intelligence about things. Um, but it did lead to some problems over the years uh, that, we, um, that we certainly could have uh, avoided. Steve, yeah. I want to ask you if you could take a position on the National Missile Defense mm -hmm. uh, Program. Okay. just alluded to that, right. it would seem like to me that in this day and age, if, if uh, the world is a much more dangerous place mm -hmm. from a nuclear proliferation point of view, that national missile defense might be a good thing. If right. we're thinking that North Korea, if we're thinking that Iran, uh, right. other states like that might right. have nukes here in right. the very near future. Right. Um, national missile defense could be 
uh, a good thing if it works, um, which has not yet been proven. And I, my major concern about the program is the same concern that I have about some of the programs that we have to deal with uh, uh, entombing nuclear waste, which is that it's being driven more by politics than by sound science. We, we were rushing to deploy something before we really had anything to deploy. And uh, I think that's unfortunate. I mean, if we're going to build a system that we are going to depend upon for our security and that we want our allies to depend upon for their security, we ought to make sure that it will actually do what it's advertised to do. Um, and that has yet to be uh, uh, proven, I think. We've made some important strides, but we have yet to show that under realistic conditions that the system would actually be as effective as we need it to be, which is to say almost completely effective. Um, I mean, I also have a problem with sort of the, the, the threat analysis here. I mean, people are saying that, that uh, ballistic missiles are sort of the weapon of choice now, that countries who want to be the you know, big guy on the block or deal with the United States are going to deploy ballistic missiles. I'm not entirely convinced of that, the North Korean example uh, notwithstanding. If only that if somebody really wants to harass us as opposed to deter us, I don't think they're going to use a ballistic missile because a ballistic missile has a return address on it. And if somebody wants to commit national suicide, that's a perfect way to do it. But I tend to believe that most leaders, no matter how quirky they might be, are ultimately concerned about self-preservation and the preservation of their country. And that doesn't seem to be a very sound way to go. I mean, if they really want to uh, uh, attack the United States, they will find some other way to do it that doesn't leave a, uh, uh, a signature. And also, a ballistic missile is just a very complicated thing to build. It takes a number of years. You've got to test it to make sure it's reliable. I mean, you could do the North Korean approach and maybe test it once and assume that it's going to work. But that's not a very good deterrent, uh, it, to my mind. It's certainly not one that, that the United States would, would rely upon. And then there's the whole issue of, of countermeasures, which I probably don't need to go into a whole lot, but just the fact that anybody who can build a ballistic missile is more likely than not going to be able to build something that will uh, uh, foil any system that we would put up. And the problem with missile defenses, as with really any defensive system, is that the attacker always has the advantage, particularly with missile defense. They'll be able to see what we're testing, what we're deploying, and then when they're ready, they can uh, come at us with something that we may not have properly anticipated, and we will have exactly one chance to get it right. Um, so I, I think at the moment, missile defense is a solution in search of a problem. And uh, it may end up being the right thing to do when we get to lower levels of weapons. But the other thing I worry about is that it is exacerbating tensions with our allies and with Russia and China in a way that could be very counterproductive. And the last thing we want to do is encourage Russia or China to retain nuclear weapons or build more of them. And missile defense may do just that, not because we intend to use it against them, but because that's what they are going to assume. And if they assume that, they're going to have to find a way to respond. So it's, uh, it's a problematic thing. Um, well, well, if I yes. could, could ask you uh, just a theater missile defense. Sure. You know, that's a different issue. Sure, yeah. OK. TMD, uh, in theory, is, should be easier, although the shorter flight times do present some problems, but I think because you're dealing with a much more circumscribed area and because the mission is much clearer, uh, uh, I think the opportunities for success are probably larger and I don't have as much of a problem with, with going forward in that. Again, I would want to make sure that it works before we, before we deploy it uh, because I think you know, just as nuclear weapons emboldened us to do things, to take stands <laughs> that we may not have taken, having a missile defense system that we believe works uh, will perhaps cause us to do things that we may not. And if it doesn't, in fact, work, we're going to wind up in a situation that we may not have expected. Uh, uh, you know, we may, we may go toe-to-toe -to -toe with North Korea, for example, if our system doesn't work and they, uh, they attack something, um, we may find ourselves committed to do something that we might not have intended to do, including perhaps up to the point of, you know, some sort of retaliatory response with nuclear weapons of our own. I can't imagine that happening, but once you start taking a stand, that could develop. So I, no, theater missile defense is something that's definitely worth exploring. Obviously, the program's had a number of difficulties. But uh, I think if we stop putting too much pressure on the scientists to achieve miracles and focus on doing the best they can and, and, and doing reliable testing, that we'll come up with a system that could actually work. Um, that's, there's lots of other things I could say. Uh, I guess I would just wrap up and say that, you know, I mean, the point of, of our book, the point of our research is to get people to start thinking about 
nuclear weapons, the U.S. nuclear weapons program, what we did during the Cold War in a somewhat different way than we have in the past. It's not to criticize the program necessarily, although there, there are certainly things that, that you can criticize, the Davy Crockett, the aircraft nuclear propulsion program, a lot of other things. Um, but to just not necessarily take it for granted that everything that we did was necessary and that it was worth it uh, from an economic standpoint. Um, again, those are debatable points. We've certainly had lots of debates and reviews of the book. Um, but I feel very strongly that if we're going to go forward into the future with nuclear weapons, which we obviously are for some indefinite period, that we really need to have a concrete, a much better understanding of how we got here and the decision process that allowed us to reach this point in time. Because if we don't understand the relatively arbitrary and the somewhat often less than rational uh, reasons that decisions were made, we're going to have a more difficult time coming up with less arbitrary, more rational decisions in the future. And I think it also, what we do also tends to rub off in our relations with other countries. If we don't understand what we're doing, we're going to have a difficult time understanding what other countries have done. Um, we had hoped that the U.S. government would pick up the ball and do its own atomic audit on an annual basis, but the uh, reaction from Congress was largely a collective yawn in 1998 when the book was released, which I thought was surprising, but uh, maybe in retrospect um, it wasn't. But uh, lots of people outside the government have found much of value in the book, and I hope you have too, and I'd be happy to answer any questions, which I imagine you have lots of. <laughs> yes? Let's, let's assume for a second that the new threat is information warfare, biological weapons. It's now a McCarthy Jr. Uh, wandering around. It's got the uh, public in panic. Uh, what, what would be some of the, the lessons Learned that, that you would apply now to this new plan mm -hmm. from the mm -hmm. nuclear age. Okay. What would be you know, three, three or four top lessons learned or the advice that you would give a senior policymaker? Right. Um, well, don't panic would be one of them. I mean, we've been through now 55 years of nuclear history with nuclear weapons, and we've been very fortunate. We came out of the Cold War not having used nuclear weapons, but also not having any serious accidents with them, although there were a number of planes that crashed with nuclear weapons or bombs fell out of them or they popped off of missiles occasionally. And I think that's largely credit to the scientists and engineers that put them together, that they didn't go off when they weren't supposed to. Um, but there's also a matter, measure of luck there, which I think cannot be discounted either. We did some very provocative things that uh, uh, you know, flying bombers on the periphery of the Soviet Union and so forth that, uh, in retrospect, were probably not necessarily the best approach. But be that as it may, we did them and we, and we survived. But um, I'm, I, I guess lessons learned from here is, uh, you know, really have good intelligence before you go forward. Um, think very carefully about what the implications of what your program will be in the near term and the long term, both on your objectives as well as anything that your opponents might try to do. I don't think that we did quite enough of that during the Cold War when it came to nuclear weapons. We tended to deploy first and analyze later. And, uh, you know, in retrospect, I mean, uh, actually, I mean, one of the, the biggest uh, untold stories of the Cold War is that the military, after building up, and I don't mean to say the military in a monolithic sense, but after we built up this enormous cache of nuclear weapons, in part because of inter-service rivalry and everything else, Leaders stood back and said, well, you know, do we really have to have these missions? Do we really have to have the Davy Crockett? Do we really have to have the Aster, you know, the nuclear power torpedo who was yield or was so high in range was so short that it would destroy the submarine that launched it as well as the submarine that we were targeting and all these other weapons. And slowly but surely, we started to pull back and eliminate missions and eliminate weapons. And that one reason that that curve but for both strategic but largely tactical weapons starts to go down. It's not because we had any arms control agreements or because people were out in the streets protesting or because members of Congress passed legislation. It's because people like you said, hey, this is not necessary anymore to achieve our objectives. Um, in, in the future, I mean, if we're talking about cyber war, information warfare, um, even chem bio stuff, I'm not sure how useful nuclear weapons will be in that world. I think that today they are largely, they seem to be largely self-deterring. They're too large, and there is too much involved with using them uh, from both a military, a political, economic, and environmental level to consider 
using them. That's not to say that we certainly don't plan to use them. We absolutely do. I mean, that's what the PSYOP is all about. That's what all the routine training is all about. But it's hard to envision how we would be better off using them than not using them, except perhaps in sort of an all-out retaliatory strike in which you know, all bets are off. But that's really the last, that's the worst case scenario there. Um, uh, I think uh, you know, we're going to see probably more examples of asymmetric warfare, not just from China, but from other adversaries who just can't compete with us on this level. And I don't think that nuclear weapons are going to, I mean, people realize that nuclear weapons are not going uh, to work. I mean, we threatened implicitly Iraq with nuclear attack, and we didn't carry it out. And so the, the obvious lesson from that is that we're not going to. If we didn't do it against Iraq in the Gulf War, and we certainly, well, we didn't plan to do it in Kosovo, but I can't imagine another situation where we would, where somebody would say, ah, that's a realistic threat. So making it, I don't think is going to, making that threat, I don't think is going to get us anywhere. Um, so I would focus on, you know, weapons that we could actually use, uh, but more importantly, probably creating conditions where we don't have to use those weapons, where we can avoid the conflict if necessary. Um, Infowar is a whole new world, though, and I'm not sure where we're going to be going with that. So, yeah. the, uh, now that the nuclear gen genie's been out of the bottle for 50 years or so, and the, the idea of having to have nuclear weapons to protect ourselves so if somebody won't nuke us, we can nuke them. Right. Can you foresee a time when we wouldn't need nuclear weapons of some sort, or some sort of deterrent? I just can't, I can't see not having the, it available unless we, right. unless we trust everybody in the world not to nuke us. Right. I think, you know, there is this, uh, it's not quite a myth, but there's this very strong feeling that you've just, uh, uh, alluded to that 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 you know, we managed to get out of this period because of nuclear weapons, and if we didn't have them, if they just went away, or we just said one day we're not going to have them anymore, that we would be at tremendous risk for blackmail or attack or whatever. Um, well, we haven't tried yet to go to significantly low levels yet. I think that we can probably get down to, you know, a thousand or fewer weapons without any significant difficulty. Can we get to zero? In today's world, no, absolutely not. And General Butler certainly uh, you know, would agree with that. Uh, and, and there are other people on the other side who have said, well, once you create the conditions where you can get to zero, by the time you've done that, you don't need the weapons anyway. So uh, it's, you're putting the cart before the horse. Um, and I think there's probably a bit of truth to that uh, argument, too. Um, I think in the meantime, though, what we can do is stop uh, creating new missions for nuclear weapons, saying that we're going to use them to deter chemical and biological attack, which I don't think is realistic. Uh, and I'm not sure would actually be a good deterrent. Uh, because there's just, even if we had lower yield, smaller lower yield weapons, which is something our weapons laboratories are actually arguing for now, that we should build a new generation of weapons that would be more usable for just that sort of attack. Uh, I think we're going to get ourselves into more trouble if we do that, because we're going to encourage implicitly or explicitly countries that have nuclear weapons or might want to acquire them to, uh, uh, to either retain what they have or to build new ones. And we're going to perhaps be on the receiving end of that, which would not be good. Is that more thunder or is that something else? Oh, oh, okay. okay. To punctuate my point. So, okay. <laughs> yes. About uh, with conditions today, we could not go to zero. Uh, what are the conditions that we could go to zero? I, whether you advocate it, right. what, what are people proposing? You know, back to the idea that the genie is out of the bottle. Right. Uh, fundamentally, what are those conditions? You know, we, in the past, we'd argue the conditions were zero use by deterrence. Right. Now, if we're saying we don't need them to have the deterrence under certain conditions, Conceivably, what could those conditions be? Everyone right. euphoria, or um, <laughs> I really don't know. Right. Well, we've obviously progressed as an international community significantly since World War II. I mean, another reason why I think there was probably no major conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union is that we were both just darn tired of it. And certainly, Russia was in no uh, sense able to embark on any sort of major world war for a number of years after World War II. Uh, and, uh, and there's been good scholarship that indicates that Stalin was not at all interested in doing that. He wanted to build up uh, uh, his forces and you know, keep what he had, but he wasn't interested in engaging the United States because he knew he would not come out of that uh, victorious. Um, so, I mean, are we, you know, are we beyond the point where people are going to have 
wars to acquire uh, large new territories. I, I'm not sure about that. I mean, you had suggested at breakfast this morning, I think that you know, China might be interested in doing something like that. Um, it's hard to know, but if, if that's what one wants to do, nuclear weapons are not the answer to that. Uh, because you know you use those and then well there's not a whole lot of territory that you're going to be able to have any uh, use for. Um, I think a necessary precondition would be certainly a large and robust conventional force, uh, perhaps some stronger alliances uh, with with other nations, and um, uh, certainly a, you know a better better means of verifying things. I mean you're never going to have absolute verification; such a thing doesn't exist. But if you have, as we have today, for example conventional forces that are more than capable of doing really any sort of damage that we would want to do short of destroying an entire country uh, and you have a means of verifying that somebody doesn't have what they say they don't have then you can start going to significantly lower levels of weapons uh, whether or not you can get to absolute zero I think it's worth making the effort if only to preclude other countries from trying to acquire more weapons of their own because at least we're making I mean we don't need what we have now. I mean, everybody, I think, has acknowledged that. Um, exactly what that number ought to be, you know, it's a matter of uh, conjecture. You know, it's what people feel, as, as Paul Robinson says in our book, it's, you know, I like the figure 1,000. I'm very comfortable with that figure. It may not have any bearing on what we would do with those 1,000 warheads, but it's a nice number for people. Um, but certainly, you know, moving away from trying to create new missions for weapons, I think, would be important beefing up what we've got conventionally, and maybe giving some serious thought to how we're going to interact with the rest of the world, since we have been, whether we like it or not, we are the leader in this, uh, in this field. I don't have any easy answers for it, but it's something that's definitely worth exploring. But, you know, that's one of the things, frankly, that, that really isn't discussed, and I think it would be interesting for, right. for someone to write about that. You know, if, if we were to pursue or encourage the world to pursue zero nuclear weapons, how do we have to build the world? Are we all friendly? Are we now encouraging everyone? You need to build up your conventional forces, or we need to pick sides, or I, I, you know, because really, people that are critical of the numbers say we can go to zero, we should be able to go to zero, but what are the condi conditions? Because we ought to try to build those conditions. Yet nobody addresses what those right. conditions are. Right. It's kind of like you know that the old fireside uh, cartoon where all these numbers are up there, and then the one step says, uh, no. and a miracle occurs in this step. <laughs> you know. You know it, I, I think that would be very interesting for someone right. to pose, this is what we ought to do right. so we could someday pursue that. Right. But, but until people do that, it, it almost becomes right. an interesting academic exercise. Yeah, I agree, and I think unlearning some of the assumptions that we have grown up with during the Cold War is essential to that, some of the assumptions that we try to deal with in the book here, because otherwise we're just going to be mired in the same thinking. Um, no, that's, I mean, people should be writing senior theses on this, and policymakers should be doing papers, and yeah, absolutely. Oh, sorry. Um, there's a, a wide range of, uh, I'm, I'm speaking of active defense, i.e. we'll look at TMD. Mm -hmm. um, there's a wide range of what's good enough, you know, from the guy being shot at, you know, he would like any chance of something deterring him from getting hit by something nasty to the other side which says you have to make sure it's 100% before you buy it. Has there been a coalition that, or a coalescing of what's good enough, like 70%, 20%, 80% that you've heard in your studies of what would be good enough before we go ahead and buy? I haven't seen any figures for TMD, for NMD, they're assuming something like 90% effectiveness, I think 90 or 95, which is given what our current technology is kind of a stretch. Um, well, I don't know. It means if you had if you had uh, you know 100 warheads that were launched at us, that you would knock down 90 of them. Well, obviously that's unacceptable because those 10 are going to go somewhere and do immense damage. Um, and that's that's assuming that we would have some ability to fire more than one interceptor. Uh, but it's really uh, you know, and that's. For the current system that we're talking about, or that the administration is proposing, I think it's problematic. If you, if you start talking about a boost phase system, I think the odds get somewhat better because then you're going after this huge Roman candle going up. And if it's got, let's say, you know, five warheads on it, you've taken out the missile and it's five warheads before it gets anywhere close to you. And you've got a much better chance of achieving that objective than you do of hitting something coming at you know, Mach whatever when you've got one or maybe you know, two chances to do it while it's streaming over, you know, we're getting very close to your territory. But unfortunately, uh, 
actually the latest I read is that we are now, because of the failures and the, the, uh, the system that we are considering, we are now taking, starting to take a more serious look at boost phase defense, which of course is what uh, people on the, uh, uh, on the other side of the debate, the, uh, mostly on the Republican right, people at the Heritage Foundation and so forth, have been arguing for years that that's what we ought to be doing. And in fact, we published an article by Richard Garwin, uh, a very eminent physicist, uh, been working on government uh, military and nuclear issues for decades now in our March-April issue that said boost phase defense is the way to go. And given how he outlined it, I think he's probably right. You know, it doesn't present the kind of treaty issues that we have. It could certainly be more effective than what we're proposing. And it's also going to be less expensive, uh, at least initially. So unfortunately, that's not where we're heading yet. <laughs> but it had, you're right. I mean, it, the effectiveness issue is a, is a real kind of killer there because, uh, you know, the old bumper stinker, one nuclear weapon can ruin your whole day, is still very much holds true. And uh, there is very, it's going to be very difficult to get around that. I mean, the problem, one of the problems I have with the way that some people have been selling missile defense to the public is that this is a cure for all of our security problems. That this will protect us, you know, in perpetuity from all these threats. Well, first of all, it only deals with ballistic missiles. It doesn't deal with cruise missiles or cruise ships or, you know, light aircraft or anything like that, but it also doesn't have a uh, very much of a margin for error. And although I guess you can make a point from a military standpoint that, you know, one nuclear weapon hitting a target is better than five, if you're under that nuclear weapon, it really isn't going to make much of a difference how many are there. You know, none is the, uh, is the acceptable number, not, not one. So, yeah. so going back to the same question, though, it sounds like 100% negation kind of sounds like the ultimate goal that we need to strive towards. Well, that's what we're striving for. I think certainly when we had air defense, that's what we would strive for. And we had multiple layers of air defense. Uh, uh, and certainly um, in, our, in our past efforts, I mean, we had, you know, most people don't realize this, but we did deploy a missile defense system called Safeguard in North Dakota in the mid-1970s. It, it frustrates me no end when people get up and say, we've never had a missile defense system. And I have to point out that well, we didn't spend $120 billion over the last 40 plus years for nothing. I mean, we had this system that cost over $20 billion, and the Army decided to shut it down because it was not effective enough and because it was very expensive to operate. And part of that was because it was circumscribed by the ABM Treaty in terms of what they could achieve. But, I mean, the real, if you want a solution to the missile defense problem, put nuclear warheads on the interceptors. That'll work. Then you don't have to be, you don't have to hit a bullet with a bullet. Then you just have to get reasonably close. But that made people uncomfortable 25 years ago, and it's going to make people uncomfortable today. Plus, blowing up nuclear weapons in the atmosphere creates some other consequences that you want to try to avoid. So, yeah. <laughs> I just wonder, when the book first came out, were, you, were there any surprises that uh, came about in terms of uh, comments the critics made or responses that people had to it? Because it's an amazing amount of information mm -hmm. and probably raised a lot of eyebrows. Well, certainly the total cost figure, I think, raised a lot of eyebrows. And I don't think that's the only way to, to measure what we did, but it's an, it's an important one. And certainly comparing it in absolute terms and relative terms um, is important. But I've had people say, you know, five and a half trillion dollars spread out over everybody living in the United States over 55 years is like a dollar a day. So what's the big deal? Well, when you look at it that way, it obviously isn't a big deal. But the important thing is that we didn't have to spend all that money to achieve the deterrent effect that we were trying to achieve. We didn't need everything that we, and, and people understood at the time that we didn't need everything, and yet there was this sort of, yeah, this momentum that we couldn't get around. Um, so that's, that, that's come up. Um, no, I mean, mostly the response was that, uh, well, it was worth it no matter what we spent, because we won the Cold War. And, you know, but winning the Cold War had its own problems, because you know, of course, what we did impacted upon the Soviet Union. They built up weapons in part because we did, not only, but in part. And when the Cold War ended, of course, everybody had all the weapons they had to begin with. And now we're spending, not nearly enough, but we're spending tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars to secure Russian materials and, and stuff that may not have existed and may not present a threat if we had done things a little bit differently. I mean, you can't go back and repeat history, but we can learn from that and try not to do the same thing again. Um, but mostly, uh, just kind of, you know, silence on the part of the official political community that, uh, in fact, uh, the uh, member of the, uh, I think it was the Senate Appropriations Committee, asked DOD to respond to the report. Were our figures accurate? You know, I mean, that's the other thing. Well, all of our data come from the Defense Department. So if there's something wrong with them, 
it's the fault of the Department of Defense. Now, I mean, it, we did the best that we could, and as well, you may not know this, but when we set out to do this, we wanted to get the most accurate figures that we could, which is why we ended up using the Futures Defense Program database, because it was a time series and it was consistent. If you go and you ask, you know, like, which we did, how much have we spent on the Minuteman Missile Force? And you ask the Air Force, you'll get one figure. If you ask STRATCOM, you get another figure. If you ask the Congressional, Congressional Budget Office, you get another figure. If you ask DOD itself, you get another figure. And nobody can tell you how these figures were derived, which is very, very frustrating. And, uh, and, and it, it just is it's obviously just a subset of the entire military budget. I mean, you probably saw this story, what, a couple of months ago, that there were something like uh, three, four, five trillion dollars in unaccounted expenditures in, in, in the military budget over some period of time that they couldn't justify, that there was no evidence of exactly how the money was spent. Um, this creates enormous problems. I mean, if we have serious problems in the military that we need to address, and one way of addressing them is to come up with more money, and one way to come up with more money is to stop spending it on things that we shouldn't be spending it on and to spend it more sensibly on things that we are spending it on. But mostly just kind of silence, which, which I thought was odd. I thought we really, I mean, I really anticipated much more of a debate than we've had. And I think to get, I, I missed the end of my story, but DOD refused to respond to Congress about this report, and I found out I, the person who, they actually called me up and they said, where did you get your data? They didn't know. I mean, they, how did you, well, we got it from you. And they declined to respond because they didn't want to foment any sort of debate about it, which I thought was very unfortunate. So. Steve, I'd like to, uh, I realize we're 1230, but there's one question sure. I, want to, I want to ask you, and this will be the last question. If you were, uh, in light of what you've said, if you were president today, uh, and, you had, <laughs> and you had a Congress that backed you, right. uh, you said that STRATCOM right now has said somewhere between two and 3,000 would be the right number of nuclear weapons we have. How many nuclear weapons would you have in our arsenal today? Uh, would you bring us down to, right. and, uh, and how would you target those? Right. Well, what STRATCOM has said is that not that that 2,000 to 2,500 would be the right number, but that if we are going to maintain our current targeting doctrine, that's the lowest number that they can go to comfortably. <laughs> what I would do is do what unfortunately wasn't done in 94, which is to actually have a viable nuclear posture review, to look at the bottom up from what is it that we're trying to achieve with our nuclear force and then size that force appropriately. Unfortunately, the NPR got hijacked by a number of people in the bureaucracy and it ended up basically ratifying the status quo. Um, so I would do that and I don't know what the result of that would be but I imagine it would be somewhat lower numbers. I would be comfortable with lower numbers if only that we, uh, we have less risk of accident ourselves and we can get Russia reduced further and we are less of a provocation to China in terms of I mean, we can actually say we have lower levels of weapons you should not be building up your weapons. I would like to see us make a commitment to go to zero, which we have done rhetorically in both treaties, uh, well, most specifically the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, but I'd like to see us actually make movement to get there, and I think the movement itself will generate some of the conditions that we were talking about. Um, you know, but I don't know exactly how I would do that. So I would, you know, I wouldn't want to pre predispose what the number should be. I would want my military advisors to tell me what it is it would do, but I would want to do something that this current president has not done, which is to say, this is what I would like the policy to reflect. This is what our national doctrine should be, and then you tell me how to achieve that. And that, unfortunately, we've had really no leadership on this issue for about eight years. So. Well.